The Easter Rising, 1916. The General Post Office, Dublin. Proclamation of the Irish Republic. Poblachnaheren, the provisional government of the Irish Republic to the people of Ireland, Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and of the dead generations from which she has received her ancient tradition of nationhood, Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. Having organized and trained her manhood through her secret revolutionary organization, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and through her open military organizations, the Irish Volunteers and the Citizen Army, having patiently perfected her discipline, having resolutely waited for the right moment to reveal itself, she now seizes that moment and supported by her exiled children in America and by gallant allies in Europe, but relying in the first on her own strength, she strikes in full confidence of victory. We declare the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. The long usurpation of that right by a foreign people and government has not extinguished that right, nor can it be extinguished except by the destruction of the Irish people. In every generation, the Irish people have asserted their right to national freedom and sovereignty. Six times during the past 300 years, they have asserted it in arms. Standing on that fundamental right and again asserting it in arms in the face of the world, we hereby proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign, independent state, and we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to the cause of its freedom, of its welfare, and of its exultation among the nations. We place the cause of the Irish Republic under the protection of the Most High God, whose blessing we invoke upon our arms. And we pray that no one that serves that cause will dishonor it by cowardice, inhumanity, or rapine. In this supreme hour, the Irish nation must, by its valor and discipline, and by the readiness of its children to sacrifice themselves for the common good, prove itself worthy of the august destiny to which it is called. Signed on behalf of the provisional government, Thomas J. Clark, Sean McDiarmide, Thomas McDonough, P. H. Pierce, Yemen Kent, James Connolly, Joseph Plunkett. These were the leaders of a gallant, doomed, yet successful rising out against British rule. We offer you some memories of them and of the other 16 men who were shot, as recorded by people who fought with them. First, two who were students at his famous school, St Enders, recall Pothrick Pierce as teacher, Major General Sweeney. He was a very good teacher as a teacher. An excellent teacher because he could convey his uh, subject to you without any any difficulty. And he always uh, moved with the, the least intelligent in the class. Uh, he didn't want to force education for the purpose of cramming at all in, in the examinations. He wrote quite a lot about uh, the educational system in the country. You may have seen a lot of it yourself. Desmond Ryan. He had a sword stick and he had a, a glove which he kept an automatic revolver in. Willie and he slept at the top of the house. There was a rope ladder, a bicycle ready in case of a raid. And you, you got used to it. I mean, one day he and Willie were going out and, and the boys, so I was uh, the only one in the house. So Pierce met me coming back up the road. He said, are you going to be in all the time? I said, yes. Well, says he, if any G-man comes, Draw a gun and shoot him. So I said, certainly, certainly, certainly. And uh, I'd made great preparations to receive the G-man. I had a rifle loaded. I had uh, an automatic revolver waiting. Even the G-man, of course, never turned up. Like most great men, Patrick Pierce was greatly influenced by his mother. 
She lived in this atmosphere. His famous three wishes he wanted to start his bilingual paper. He wanted to start his bilingual school. He wanted to head an insurrection. Well, Maggie said to me, as the senator, she said, oh, I think Pat is rather on for leading the insurrection now. Mother thinks Pat is a young god. But she knew Pat was going to lead the insurrection sometime or other. And uh, sure he was. But there was a very funny incident occurred about that. Long before the volunteers or any hint of uh, risings or anything, an English company decided to shoot an Irish uh, film. So they thought St. Enders was a very good place. It was a real old melodrama. You know, fellas in red coats and fellas in green <coughs> coats. And... So we got up the avenue they came this day marching. So Mrs. Pierce saw it. Oh, she nearly fell. Oh, God, she says, they're coming to take poor Pat and shoot him. That was the atmosphere. Pierce's oratory is a legend. Dominica Reardon tells how scrupulously he prepared the Donovan Rosser oration. His father had given him a tape recorder, or the tape recorder of the time, which at that time was a wax machine. Pierce spoke it over and over again, over that wax recorder. He practised and practised. And what he said was, I will say it in a monotone until I come to those lines. The fools, the fools, the fools. And when asked why he deliberated on this, he said, I based it on the Easter liturgy, the Lumen Christi, where the priest rises a tone every time, advancing from the door of the church to the altar. The fools, the fools, the fools. Lumen Christi, Lumen Christi, Lumen Christi. Not so romantic was James Connolly, the Commandant, and one of the great Marxists of his time. Less magnetic than Pierce, less easily liked than his fellow trade unionist Jim Larkin, to many people a bit of an enigma. Professor Liam O'Brien says, Very few people knew Connolly. I don't know that anyone knew him. He was a mystery. He could keep his own counsel. Oh, Lord, yes. But he was terrific. He was like iron. When his feet were shot to bits and he was in the front room, he wouldn't be moved. He said, no, this is my place. Oh, he was a relentless man. He, he was the same in 1913. I mean, he was twice as tough as Larkin any day. Larkin was a very good man, a very more poetic, more human. You'd like Larkin more than Connolly. Connolly was very hard to like. He was too much intellect and slightly suspicious. Oh, more than slightly. Pierce got on with him very well. Bulmer Hobson, while admiring him, is sceptical of some of his theories. Connolly said the working class is always revolutionary. Somebody's just got to strike a match and it goes up like powder. I'm afraid I got rather irritated. I said, Connolly, if you must talk in metaphors, the working class in Ireland, it's not a powder magazine. It's a wet bog, and the match will drop into a puddle. Helena Maloney recalls... Connolly was very... He was a good suffragist himself, you know, and he was very keen on absolute equality between men and women. If a girl could handle a gun, she was given a gun. If a man could cook a meal, he was expected to cook it and not feel in any way degraded by it. Everyone had to do wherever their capability lay to do that work for Ireland's sake. Connolly knew that socialists would misinterpret his commitment to Irish nationalism, but he was altogether an Irish patriot, though totally free of romantic illusions. Owen Sheehy Skeffington recalls a story his mother told him. Yes, well, my mother used to tell the story of how she met James Connolly uh, about ten days before the rising, and as we were talking about it, it suddenly crossed her mind that she was talking to a man who might be about to die. And she said to him, tell me, Jim, have you ever any hope of anything on the other side? And he said, the British Labour Party? Oh, no, they won't lift a finger to help us. And she laughed and she said, well, no, I, I wasn't really thinking of that. I was thinking of something higher up. 
And then he laughed. He threw his head back and said, well, no, I'm afraid I haven't time for any of that just now. Most loved as a human being was the IRB organiser Sean McDermott. All the boys admired him. All the girls loved him. Dennis McCullough, in 1916, the supreme head of the IRB, asks... You ever see a picture of Sean McDermott? He's an exceedingly handsome boy, he's a beautiful head, and that sallow complexion that has a certain beauty of its own, you know. And uh, a lovely outline of face. Sean McDermott came in, and he was the essence of an old Hibernian. He had never been in any national thing except the engine or the Hibernians in, in, in Glasgow. Well, now, I have met three men in my lifetime. I've met a whole lot of men in my life, but my three associates, Sean McDermott, Bulmer Hobson, and Pat McCartan, and they were tone deaf. As tone deaf as that there. None of them could sing God Save the King from God Save Ireland. And they couldn't sing two notes in, in, in unison with you. And I was rather musical, and I, I, I used to lead the singing, you know, God Save Ireland. <laughs> with one of them on each side of me singing up, up the field and one down the field. I couldn't keep in tune of a time. Mrs Mulcahy? We always had to carry a stick. And so that in that way he wasn't able, but then otherwise he was absolutely perfect and so far as his mind was concerned. He was full of fun. And although I knew him intimately, really, and saw him very, very often, and all my family, we did see him an awful lot, he never gave away a single thing to me about what they were doing. Not one thing. For all his gaiety, McDermott knew the death his work was leading to. McDermott suddenly turned on him. Oh, he says, don't worry about me, my friend, he said. I'm going to be shot. And he says, and if I'm not shot, all this is worthless. Mrs. Richard Mulcahy and her youngest sister, Mrs. Sean T. O'Kelly, were allowed to visit McDermott just before his execution. Although he was going to be executed, certainly <laughs> there was no luxury about the place he was in, you see, the cell. We had a sort of a raised board and the tree was sat on that. There was a little small table over here with the a candle on it, a, a very guttering sort of a candle coming down on the table, where he signed his will there, where his uh, sister came in. And uh, otherwise the place was absolutely bare, and there was a, an ordinary soldier standing right inside the door with a, his bayonet and all, standing inside the door, listening to everything. And Sean talked all the time about all his friends, and he... He had a uniform on him and he cut the buttons off of it. Very difficult because he couldn't get anything to cut them. <laughs> but he cut them off to give to various people. as uh, I think. And he was just the same as if he was outside. We all tried to keep up, of course, very much. And then the priest came and then the soldier said, we'd have to go. So um, we all said goodbye to him. And the only thing that he said to me that was... Uh, in any way of a come down from that gate, he was, he said, we never thought it'd end like this. You see, just that much, but that was all. Mrs. Sean T. O'Kelly remembers... A terrible experience. We were driven through this awful dark night through the city, across to see him in this awful cell with his candle lighting and a soldier sitting in a corner. And he talked to us for a, quite a long time. And he seemed the same as ever, but he, he, he was just as... He seemed to be almost as gay as ever. You couldn't imagine that he was a man going to die. But, he, of course, he was telling us how happy he was that the rising had come off, the greatest dream of his life. And uh, if he lived, all he wanted to do was to do the same thing all over again. We said goodbye to him, and that was that. We came home, and we knelt down and said our prayers for him, and I remember weeping, 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 weeping at the thought that I'd lost the greatest friend I ever had when he, when he was lost like that, when he was executed. The aristocrat and passionate Republican Countess Markovitz, Madam, as she was known, was dearly loved by the starving Dublin workers. Oh, yes, all these men would have worshipped her at a contest. She was going on, they loved her. They really did. It was extraordinary. All these poor chaps are all labouring lads, you know, labouring men from all over the city, everywhere, poor men. But Madame, oh, they're all ready to die for Madame. And she'd go round with her nervous, uh, rather highly strung way, very much of, uh, 
what you call a, a gentry way, if you understand me, uh, but very effective with them. She was so sincere, you know, she loved them all, and they loved her, and then they all remembered uh, what she'd done during the strike three years previously, when she'd been washing and cooking and bringing swarms of children home to her house, you know, all through that strike, so much so that her husband, poor old Count Cassie Markievicz, the Pole, used to say, I can't get into my own house, my wife has the house full of children. She says to me, Cassie, go my way, go my way, there's no room for you here tonight, go somewhere else. Liam O'Brien. I remember passing her house at Leinster Road. Terrific crowd outside. The counters in the middle haranguing them. And the police looking very sheepish. Said, these scoundrels, the day will come when, please be to God, they'll taste the cold steel. Said, come into the house, everyone. They might have been packed with British spies or God knows who. Everyone came into the house. Do you know I've just escaped? I've just escaped... Ten years penal servitude. We got two loads of galignite over the garden wall just in time, just before those devils came. Then she plunged her hand in. She was lighting Banaba cigarettes. They were Irish cigarettes, and they were bloody awful cigarettes. She plunged her hand into her pocket. She got out a whole lot of bullets. Oh, boys, she said to the end, won't it be a glorious day when we all put these bullets through the enemies of Ireland? Michael Mellin was Countess Markovitch's commanding officer. Like many men in the Rising Out, he'd served in the British Army. He commanded the Citizens Army Contingent at Stevens Green and later in the College of Surgeons, where he exercised military control. Liam O'Brien. Mellon came in and looked up. And suddenly saw one of the pictures blank. It was an oil painting. It had been cut out. And Mallon said, who, who cut that out? And there was a little typical Dublin gutty, probably a uh, volunteer, and he said, I cut it out. Do you know who it was, said Mallon? I do, of course, the old Victoria, Queen Victoria. I said, how dare you do that? He said, I wanted to cut it up for leggings. He said, we are not vandals. We didn't come out to destroy portraits. If you ever do that again, I'll shoot you. Unique in that time was the suffragette, pacifist, socialist, Sheehy Skeffington. O'Casey said that he was the greatest of all, an unbiddable man, as his son remembers. In a speech from the dock in which he denied the, the right of England to uh, have courts at all in this country, he said that he would be out, alive or dead, long before the six months. And he went on hunger and thirst strike. My mother had earlier been on hunger strike, for this was the, his first time. And uh, he lasted, in fact, for nine days. Uh, many doctors have told me that this is impossible, but the texts are there and the newspapers can confirm that. <clears throat> and on the ninth day, he was released under the... A Cat and Mouse Act, which enabled the government to re-arrest him uh, and put him in jail again without a fresh trial. Now, I have a memory of his coming home at that time. I was a little boy of six playing in the front garden and uh, seeing him being helped up the path by a taxi man and being shocked. I can remember the emotional shock of seeing uh, this man whom I had seen hale and uh, fit. He was never a fat man, but he was wiry and muscular. Uh, I'd seen him ten days before, and now I was seeing a man who looked very like a skeleton being helped up the path. Oldest, most tempered by suffering, was the Fenian, Tom Clark. Incorruptible, like his contemporary John Devoy, the IRB organiser in New York. John Devoy was a, was a very remarkable man. He was a man, again, more or less like Tom Clark. A man more or less of one mind. One thing, one thing in life to be got. And that was to get England out of this. The first president of the Irish Republic, Sean T. O'Kelly, celebrates him. There's no greater man amongst them than Tom Clark, who had spent 15 years as a convict in English prisons. And then he had been amongst the dynamitards sent over from uh, America the Clannagale, the Irish Republican people in the United States, sent him over as a young fellow with others to dynamite certain buildings in, in England. 
part of the propaganda for Irish independence. And he was caught and uh, sentenced. He did at least 15 years. He wrote a short account of that. And to think of a man coming out after the terrible sufferings he went through and the tortures he went through, still keeping alive, many died, still alive and coming out as determined as ever to carry on the fight. The few hundred men who turned up in Easter week belonged in the main to two organisations, the Irish Volunteers and the Citizens' Army. Curiously enough, the citizen, the, the citizen army started as a kind of peaceful citizens group for the purpose of ensuring that uh, strikers and the worker, working class movement could, have, could hold meetings without their being broken up uh, by strike breakers. Uh, <clears throat> the William Martin Murphys of the time had organized uh, strike breakers and the police were very uh, slow in interfering with uh, strike breakers of this kind and when the workers tried to hold meetings they sometimes found it very hard. The volunteers had been formed in the south after Carson had roused in the north of Ireland a mass movement against the Home Rule Bill promised by the British government. The Ulster volunteers openly and vigorously declared their intention of fighting the British government by all means to resist Home Rule. They had illegally but publicly and brilliantly run into the port of Larne a consignment of arms for distribution to their members. The South thought source for the northern orange goose was source for their own green gander and they too began to arm. Irishmen in the South, denied by the British government the right to fight in the British army under their own colours, flocked to join. The Irish Parliamentary Party, led by John Redmond, split the movement and by far the greater part followed him in his willingness to accept conscription for England's war against Germany. The minority, led by Professor John McNeill, stood for an independent or republican Ireland. Much loved was the O'Reilly, who played his part in cancelling, but then came back to die. Sing of the O'Reilly, who had such little sense, he told Pierce and Connolly he'd gone to great expense, keeping all the Kerry men out of that crazy fight, that he might be there himself, had travelled half the night. But the Irish volunteers were divided internally between the open organisation led by MacNeill and, among others, the O'Reilly, who thought insurrection at that time, with a shortage of arms and a lack of mass public support, would be madness, and the secret section of underground members organised by the oath-taking society, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, known as the IRB. The leaders of this were Porthrick Pierce, Sean McDermott and the other signatories, with the exception of James Connolly, a Marxist and a trade union leader who commanded the Citizens' Army. There's a story that Connolly was kidnapped by Pierce and McDermott. Certainly he disappeared for some days, and when he returned, his alarmed followers would tell them nothing beyond the fact that joint agreement had been made on a date for the rising out. Carl O'Shannon. A motor car took Connolly from Liberty Hall out to an IRB man's house in Dolphin's Barn. Now that was arranged by Pierce. Connolly was there. They came to agreement on the date, or they persuaded Connolly. Uh, and I think it was a, a, a big strain on Connolly himself. He was absent for two or three days, and when he came back, he wouldn't tell anybody, not even his closest friends, where he had been or what uh, he had been doing. Uh, Plunkett's sister asked Plunkett uh, where he had been for a couple of days. Ah, says he jocularly, we were kidnapping Connolly. Uh, says his sister, I would as soon attempt to kidnap a tiger as to kidnap uh, Connolly. That, uh, Duke went round a bit and it was really thought for a good many years that Connolly had been kept, arrested, detained by the IRB, but it wasn't so. Connolly was always a word unto himself, as Helena Maloney reminds us. At that time, for weeks, weeks longer, many weeks beforehand, Connolly had a scheme which I think worked very well. 
There was a very big blackboard outside, about six feet by three, outside the front door of Liberty Hall, on which every week and every Saturday there were flamboyant notices chalked. Assemble tomorrow, full equipment, for an attack on Wellington Barracks. The next week it would be assemble, fully armed and so on, for an attack on Dublin Castle. And another week it would be attack on some other barracks. Well, of course, I, 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 these were all fictitious. We went on route marches. We didn't make any attack anywhere. But I said one day to Connolly, I said, why do you put out these notices that, that don't mean anything, only turning the eyes of the police on us? And he smiled and said, ah, did you never hear the story of wolf, wolf, wolf? Pierce, too, appreciated this technique, as he explained to his school pupil, Desmond Ryan, who asked him, Why do you make these uh, violent speeches? Why do you write so much? Don't you think the British will tumble to it? Good God, no, he says, the last thing they'll tumble to. He says they're sick of hearing this for the last 60 years and nothing happened. It's the most safest thing I could say. Do you think they think I'd run an insurrection? with a few guns and the whole majority of the Irish people against me, including the Redmond and his party. Nonsense, he said. Oh, but jo Joseph Plunkett didn't approve of that. He said, the British are not such fools as you think. He said, for God's sake, keep quiet and keep your wild young savages in St. Enders quiet. They're always talking about that when we're going to put up the barricades. Tell them to stop. This was on the eve of the rising. It was a bit dangerous, I admit. So Pierce sent for me and he said, well, look here, he said, when you are outside this house, will you please shut up? The guns were indeed few. Senator Hayes. As far as my memory serves me, they were expecting about 400 men. And they had about 250 assorted weapons. That would include Holt rifles. They were long, extremely heavy rifles with a flat-nosed bullet. Uh, single shot Martini Enfields, Shortley Enfields, shotguns and revolvers. And they had about five rounds of assorted ammunition per weapon. There were a certain number of Shortley Enfields, which were the Ar British Army rifle of the time. They were either stolen from or cajoled from soldiers home on leave. Liam O'Brien. I was a member of the old Dublin Brigade regularly from the beginning of the war, you might say, from September 1914 until Easter week, very regularly, because we were ordered to have no other appointments on drill nights, none, whatever. Had to be there, absolutely, that was so, as well as in manoeuvres. But as the result of it, oh, the only means we had of, uh, of acquiring any rifle practice was a little miniature rain of 25 yards with a miniature rifle in a hall. When Easter week came, I would have been possibly able to hit a haystack at 50 yards. Being a drill with wooden poles. God help us if we had got into close quarters with the British Tommies of that period. They had homemade bombs too. Awful bombs. We had with cocoa tins with a piece of string out of them that you had to set fire to with a match and then get rid of them. Some of them in three seconds, others of them in eight seconds. Very dangerous things. Fortunately, we never had to use them during the subsequent week. But despite the shortage of arms, the spirit was high. A rank-and-file volunteer, Paddy O'Connor, tells of Easter Monday morning. When I came home, my mother gave me my dinner and told me, eat it up and eat plenty. And she said, I'll get your traps ready. And <laughs> she did. She put a rifle beside me and other gear. But I do remember when I was moving off by myself, no other member of the family was at home. They are all out. So, I thought Mother didn't quite understand where I was going and <laughs> that I mightn't be back, you know. And I told her that, Mother, I said, you know, I mightn't be coming back anymore. Oh, she said, I understand that all right. But she said, come on now, like a goodbye and God bless you and do your best. The principal buildings occupied in Dublin were Boland's Mill, where de Valera was in command, the Forecourts, Stevens Green and the College of Surgeons, Mount Street Bridge, 
and North King Street, where the bloodiest fighting took place, and, of course, the GPO. These were sites that made nonsense of any professional military operations, but they were well chosen to make the maximum effective political demonstration. General Mulcahy says, The men that went in had no opportunity of effective and successful soldierly action. They could do nothing but go in and hold their places and stand their ground until the end came. It was the action of a citizen giving away his life in defiance of guns that marks the spirit of Mount Street and marks the spirit of the mendicity in the South Dublin Union and the Four Courts. The whole action was marked by a purity of intention, integrity of purpose, and a sweetness and loyalty between the participants, even when, as in the case of McNeil and Pierce, each had ruined the other's policy. This is apparent in the memories of the survivors and in the unpompous humour that breaks through when they look back and consider the inadequacy of their own forces. Sean McEntee tells of how he made a later start than he intended on his long journey into the GPO. It was arranged that some person would go over, buy my ticket, come back, and all I would have to do would be to walk through the barrier and get into the train. The reason being in case that some person might follow me from Liberty Hall and I might not be able to make the journey. This messenger went over, got my ticket, I went over with him, and when I got there, the train was leaving the platform at that time halfway down the platform, perhaps. So I came back very, very crestfallen to Liberty Hall and met Connolly and told him what I had done. Oh, he said, my God, man. I said, it's not my fault. I, I went by the clock. Oh, I'm pointing to the clock on the wall. Oh, he says, doesn't everybody know that that clock is always five minutes slow? General Mulcahy. Sean said to me, Tell me, he said, have you plans for blowing up the telegraph system in Dublin? I said, no. And he measured some words of dissatisfaction, and I began to think. I was the clerk in charge of the office, working under the engineers there. I was the person that kept up to date all the Van Dyke plans uh, that marked the routes underground and overhead and that. I was in touch with the men who were foremen and workmen and all that. I had mentioned a few of them for Dermot to go and see. And apparently something was up. And here was I. I had cut myself off from my office, apart altogether from going on for a bit of relaxation and that. Sean said to me, I'll see you tomorrow, he said. I said, well, you see me, 25 Parnell Square, he said. What time? 10 o'clock. In the morning, I said. No, he said, in the evening. And here I found myself up against it. The holiday that I had planned was that I was going to, on Sunday night, to the Jesuit retreat house in Milltown Park, where you got a room to yourself, you got a fire in your room that sparkled on the ceiling all night if you wanted to because coal was fairly plentiful at that particular time in the First World War. No one spoke to you for four nights and the intervening days. You quietly listened to some lectures in the church about three or four times a day and you walked the grounds. I had been working very hard at all kinds of things and I was exhausted and my summer holidays had gone on volunteer training. And I was thirsting for a bit of a rest and for the breath of the spring air down over the limestone country of Clare, where I intended to go down to where my father was. And I saw all that thing going smash. But Sean certainly was very uh, uh, vigorously full of comment on that. He gave quite a list of people that could very well go there, you see, if I would meet him at 10 o'clock on the night. But I, I was so exhausted that I determined that I was going to have my rest of that particular kind 
and I said that I'd meet him on Thursday morning. And that appeared to satisfy him. The McNeil cancellation wrecked most of the projected actions outside Dublin. But at Finglas, Thomas Ashe carried out a successful local rising in which Richard Mulcahy played a, a leading part. As we cycled the quarter of a mile or so from Maxwell House to Sutton Cross, I looked at Tom for a moment and I said, have you gone, Tom? I have, he said. Where is it? It's at home, he says. I said, well, you'd better go home for it. You see, we may want it. It was a revolver he had. And I kept in my pocket two small hand pliers. We wanted to have something. I wanted to put insulation tape on them in case cutting the wires you got a tingle. You wouldn't get a curtain, but you get a tingle that you might absentmindedly drop it. We were only able to cut the wires to Belfast. Meantime, I was collared by a rather simpleton young man of about 21 years of age, who was round there picking primroses for his mother. And with uh, very awkward feelings, I had to assist him for a while to pick the primroses. Mulcahy emphasised the absence of detailed planning, even at Finglas. But when you look to Finglas, there was no plan for the Finglas people as far as the general rising plan, once they were cut off from Dublin. They had to go off and formulate their own plan. The plan in Belfast was, as Connolly and Pierce told McCullough, the leader in Belfast, was that no shot must be fired in Ulster. Dennis McCullough himself says that Connolly told him, Your orders are to mobilise your men, take them to Tyrone, join the Tyrone men, and march with them to Connaught and join Mellows. You're going through Orange Country the whole way to Belfast. And when you start from there, you're going through Orange Country into Fermanagh. And you're passing through Enniskillen, which the British always kept as a redoubt. Because you have to cross the Shannon there if you're going into Connaught. You have to cross the Shannon and Enniskillen. And the military people in, in England always kept that as a garrison town. I knew that was hopeless. And I said to Connolly, I said, uh, Commandant, I haven't the arms and I haven't the means to do that. That's a long trek and it's a long job and I couldn't do it unless I got more arms. But I said, I'm making preparations for that. What do you mean, he said. I have a man in Belfast, he said, making hand grenades. We have got some jetting knife from Scotland. And uh, I propose to make hand grenades and attack police barracks as we go and get what arms we can. And he turned fiercely to me. He said, you'll do no such thing, Common. You'll do no such thing. You'll fire no shot in Ulster. You'll join the Tyrone man and you'll march with all possible speed to join Mellows and Comet. So I, I turned to Pierce and I said, is that an order, Commandant? It is, he said, uh, Common, you, you'd, and you'd obey it strictly. Of course, I wouldn't have taken an order from Connolly so much. I took my orders from the IRB. But the, the, the military council had been appointed by the IRB, so I suppose I had to pay some attention to it. Apart from the epic stand at Mount Street Bridge and Clan William House, the fiercest fighting was in King Street North, as Judge Lynch remembers. For the first three or four days, things were quite enough with us. But coming on towards Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, things began to get hot and we were get, getting under pretty heavy fire. And Shoaldice's area, especially just at the corner of North King Street, was under a very heavy fire. And his place was nicknamed Riley's Fort. I think Riley had been the name of the public house owner who owned it at some time, but was then closed up and hadn't been used as a pub for some time before that. The fighting, heavy fighting, lasted until the surrender, practically. Uh, the soldiers broke through from house to house. They burrowed through from house to house. And we discovered afterwards, of course, long afterwards, that many men caught in the, uh, found in the house were, that we had no knowledge of, who had not, knew nothing about us, who weren't connected with the thing at all, were unfortunately shot by the military. But assuming that, presumably, they thought 
that they had just thrown away their guns and come back and were hiding behind the women, as General Maxwell said afterwards, we all were. At any rate, some of the soldiers who appeared to be either very stupidly led or if they had any leader with them at all, they came through and uh, the last house before Cuckoo Lane. Now, they turned into Cuckoo Lane at the double, about a dozen of them. And this was just completely under our fire. Frank Scholdice, Lieutenant Scholdice's brother, was in the malt house, just covering the place absolutely. We had other men in the trenches that were dug for sewage and so on for the new houses that were going up. Drains were dug, the houses weren't built, do you see? And we had men there, and these lads were wiped out in no time. It was, uh, of course, a tragic thing in many ways. When you, one had to be sorry for them. They were only very young boys. And in fact, uh, Lieutenant Shouldice told me that when he went to collect the rifles with others, he hit so that he heard one lad saying, Oh, mammy, mammy, which was uh, terrible. The dead, both civil and military, were part of the blood sacrifice that Pierce and MacDonald had forecast in their poems and plays. Yeats wrote later, Oh, words are lightly spoken, said Pierce to Connolly. Maybe a breath of politic words has withered our rose tree, or maybe but a wind that blows across the bitter sea. It needs to be but watered, James Connolly replied, to make the green come out again and spread on every side and shake the blossom from the bud to be the garden's pride. But where can we draw water, said Pierce to Connolly, when all the wells are parched away? Oh, plain as plain can be, there's nothing but our own red blood can make a right rose tree. Sean McEntee doubts very much whether Connolly shared this view. Yes, and perhaps Joe Plunkett, from what I know of him, may have had that idea of making a blood sacrifice. I doubt if, if that was a really a compelling motive in the case of James Connolly. One just can't believe it. Of course, I'm only guessing about what may have been in dead men's minds. But one would assume that with the war going, as it then appeared, against Great Britain, four Americans had come in. They might have had the idea that if they were in the field and there was any question of peace negotiations, that they would have established a, a right to be heard. Many streams of Irish life joined in the great river of insurrection. There was the language revival expressed in the Gaelic League, its parallel sports organisation, the Gaelic Athletic Association. There were the old Fenian tradition. There was Sinn Féin and middle class and intellectual nationalism. Major Florence O'Donoghue points out... Behind all these movements you had the Secret Irish Republican Brotherhood, a very small organisation numerically, not more than 2,000 strong in the whole country and Britain, scattered and an organization without military training, without arms, but a focus for the idea that Irish freedom would have to be attained in arms, that the country would have to recover in arms what had been taken from it by arms and fraud. Sean T. O'Kelly came in at first on the language revival. I joined the Gaelic League shortly after I left school. That wasn't a political organization, but in a way, the movement to revive the language brought into a foremost place in all the minds of the young people who uh, joined the Gaelic League, the principle of Ireland's separate and distinctiveness and separate nationality. 
that helped me in the direction that I had already been brought up and that I wished to go. And very early in the century, I joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood. That was in early in 1902. And from that on, I was a devoted preacher and apostle of Irish independence as opposed to the vast majority of the Irish people who supported John Redmond, the Irish Parliamentary Party, and the Home Rule Movement. Sean McEntee had the problem of keeping his faith alive in the Protestant North. No Irish boy of that period could grow up in Ireland, particularly uh, after Parnell, and not have this fed into him. School everywhere. Everywhere he went, there was this, and uh, particularly in Belfast, where one uh, had to uh, keep on uh, asserting one's faith and, 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 uh, and keeping it aflame. There are still people who believe that Ireland would have got her freedom without the Easter Rising. Bulmer Hobson, who'd been held under arrest by the IRB while the Rising got going, thinks like this. Without the insurrection, the castle was undoubtedly going to jail all the volunteer leaders at that particular moment. And there would have been a long period of in and out of jail and increasing agitation. And then the guerrilla war would have started. I was quite clear in my mind that the one way to get the English out of Ireland was a sort of passive resistance that was edged gradually into a guerrilla business. And whether it won or not, at least gave you the opportunity to carry on for years. Some people claimed that it was only the execution of the 16 men that mobilised mass opinion. Not so Richard Mulcahy. I have never regarded it that the executions ultimately made any difference to the gathering strength and the gathering uh, movement of the people to secure the full freedom of this country. To discuss it is to move away from the clear understanding of what the men who made the raising intended it to be and what it was. People say that it was a minority move. A detonator is a minority thing which detonates latent and powerful forces that are there. And what the rising was, that it alerted and it detonated the whole strength of the people. Sean T. O'Kelly has no doubts about the need and virtue of Easter Week. I was, like all Ireland was, grievously disappointed that the British Liberal government had sold Ireland down the river over home rule. They betrayed John Redmond and his part. They let them down badly. They should have put the Home Rule Bill into operation before the war. They should have suppressed the bitter opposition of their political opponents who were assembled in great numbers in Belfast to back the Unionists there. They did nothing. They didn't lift a finger against them. One minister lost his post. That's the minister for the army. One minister lost his post. But they let Bonner Law, the leader, and they let Carson, and the man who became Lord Chancellor afterwards, Birkenhead, they let them preach rebellion. But as soon as we showed any sign of being rebellious, we were pounced upon by the law. But none of the unions were. 
I'm satisfied that the rising was the proper thing to do. I'm not a bit ashamed of anything that took place in the rising. We have no reason to be ashamed of it here in Ireland. Our prisoners, if the British did the proper thing, our prisoners should have been treated as prisoners of war. They shouldn't have executed them. Any one of them, many of those who were executed, only preached rebellion. They didn't take up a gun. Why shouldn't some of the unionists have been treated as badly as they were? That's my stand. And I'm proud of having taken a humble part in the rising, and I think it was necessary at that time. Dennis McCulloch. I said to Boonmer Hobson, Boonmer was very wroth, you see, about Mike Darman. He said he was a, a bloody old hib who was used to intrigue. And, uh, but I said, it comes very badly from you or from me. Neither of us turned out. To say about these men, about Tom Clark or, or, or Sean McDermott, they did what they believed to be right and they paid for it with their lives. And I have nothing to say against them. For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know their dream. Enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse. Macdonough and McBride and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be wherever green is worn, are changed. Changed utterly, a terrible beauty 